Welcome to another episode of Stockport Grammar School Talk Sport. Uh, today we've got somebody from the recruitment world of football who is the genius, uh, produced many, many players who've gone on to play and get careers in the professional game. Um, and this bloke is called Martin Waldron. Welcome to Stockport Grammar School Talk Sport. Martin. I'm pleased to be here, Dan. No, no, thank you very much for your time, pal. I um, really appreciate it. So we'll, we'll, we'll crack on. Um, could you just talk to the listeners a little bit about your journey from from a schoolboy, I guess, to where you are today? Yeah, uh, as well, as a youngster, my, my position was a goalkeeper, uh, playing for the school and that. But wasn't, wasn't the best, wasn't blessed with height to be a goalkeeper. But I seem to understand the game a lot, uh, how you play it and, and how to watch it, you know, uh, which helps you in the future. And then I got involved in junior football. Uh, I had a bit of a decent team in the Merseyside area, which I'm Leighton Baines in it, Ryan Taylor played for Newcastle, David Nugent, who played quite a few teams, Derby, Preston, and all that. And then a couple of others, I think it was three others, yeah, three others who went on to play uh, professional football, just from a local team. Uh, and then started another little team up, and from that little team, another eight went on to play for England schoolboys. So I've become the Pied Piper of uh, talent locally. Uh, I'd done a year at Liverpool scouting for a, a scout called Ewan McCauley and then Everton coming for me and Everton was my club. Uh, although it took them a month to take me because I had a bit of loyalty about me uh, and in the end I went and and at, at first I thought, well, I'm lucky. I'm, I'm picking all the players and actually I wasn't lucky. I learned that it was hard work and watching more games and being dedicated Actually, it's not luck. It's, it's it's that's what it is. It's hard work. Anyone in your school when they leave school can be whatever they want, as long as they work hard. And you ain't managed to say work hard, work hard. It brings you success. Well, it do, it's the same with recruitment. The more games you watch and get out and watch, the more plays you're going to get. I mean, a prime example going back years ago was a uh, people won't know it, but we had, I had Scott Metonymy at Everton. So I brought Scott in from his team and, uh, and I went to Manchester on a Sunday morning, watched the tournament, went to Preston in the afternoon, watched the tournament. And I got wins. Scott was playing in an under six tournament, a half four in the Lake District. So I was like that. And I had a couple of my staff with me as going, do you fancy a dinner? And we'll go and watch this tournament. So anyway, I watched Scott's pitch because, you know, obviously I want to get Scott to sign for Everton. And on that pitch was two other boys, was Liam Walsh, who's now at Bristol City, yeah. and Callum Dyson, who, went, who had a, a professional career until he got injured. So in that, that one under six game was three professional footballers. I managed to secure two of them forever. I lost out to Scott because he was a Man United fan. Mm. Yeah, so it was disappointing, but do you know what? I'm proud of him regardless because what I've seen then, I see now, and he's made it a career. And, had a lovely family and that's all I made up with it. But that hard work of going that extra yard on a Sunday afternoon when you could easily go home and put your feet up. And I didn't. And it's just it's just a hard work that work uh, ethic I had. And we got two professional footballs out of them. So they the, 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 that's what gets you there is the hard work and and, and as you get into the, your career. You start to pick the knowledge up of what a player should look like. And when, and it was weird that like, when players were coming into me for the first time, if, uh, like Belfield, they have a training ground, you knew right away oh, it's going to be tough for him. The way they walked, the way they presented themselves, you just knew what a footballer should look like. And nine times out of ten, you were right. They weren't there that long. And when you go to a pitch, it's easy, right, ruling out who you don't think will have a chance to narrow it down to one or two to watching the game. And that just makes the process a lot easier to watch the game quicker. And uh, you know, there's loads of little traits and things you pick up as I started in my career. And I, I had a, a, a head of recruitment at Everton who looked after me called Barry Poynton. And I still to this day think Barry was the best recruitment officer I've worked with. Mm. He knew the game inside out. And I remember him saying to me, look after your staff and they look after you. It's a bit like Del Boy, look after your uh, <laughs> trigger with his brush, look after your brush and the brush will look after you. <laughs> yeah. But it was that. 
that still stood in my mind. And when I took over everything, I looked after my staff and took out the meals at Christmas, the drink, and just made them feel special. And that's the way for you and not the club. Mm-hmm. And like majority of them left when I left. And a lot of them still work with me in the, in the agency world now, so they keep an eye open for me. And all them little bits that you learn in the game takes you a long way. Loyalty for me was a major one. Mm-hmm. Um, I had many opportunities to leave Everton to go to bigger clubs and go around the world and that. And I never took it because I had loyalty. I had a, a chief exec there called Robert Elstone, who, who you know. Uh, mm-hmm. It was outstanding. If I wanted to sign a chair next to me for half a million and I said, it's going to make it, he'd let me. And you, you can't get that in many clubs and I had it and, and recruiting led everything at Everton. So it, in the academy, it got to a stage where I made the decisions, recruiting made the decisions, not the coaches, because we're the experts. They're the experts at coaching. We're the experts at identifying. And I think that's a key part of why we had a good success was that mm. having that trust off Robert and, and the, the club to let you get on with it. Mm. No, good. And then in, in terms of um, your role as head of cr- recruitment, what what day to day did it involve? Uh, it was a long day. You start off with phone calls in the morning, yep. meetings with your staff, planning for the week. Uh, I mean, we, we were like unbelievable. We had over 300 scouts, which is a lot to manage. Yeah. And it, there was a tour, it, well, it was, it was like 10 tournaments on a Saturday and 10 on a Sunday in the summer. And we'd have a scout for every pitch, every tournament. Yeah. And then you'd have a senior member of staff floating around where the, the, the not so senior staff might like someone but's not sure. And he goes over and watches them. Yeah. And I thought we were, we were ruthless in terms of covering everything. Uh, especially in the summer tournaments uh, and also in the leagues you had a database where every team had to be watched twice a season now that's a some achievement to get that done because it was you know it just amazing side alone there was I think 31 leagues when it started yeah. and then you got Manchester and Yorkshire and Lancashire that was some took some going and I, I think the, the best achievement I think we got to 97% one season of coverage and the same with professional coverage around the country. I had a hundred odd scouts work on just the professional side of the game, and they just watched academies and and again the coverage of that was unbelievable. The only the only way we didn't cover it was under fifteen games because they were hard to get into. There were midweek games now and then, so around, I think we got over ninety odd percent on the professional side as well, which is good. Yeah, Mark, um, do you think recruitment is the most important thing to an academy? Oh, yeah. Listen, you can have the best coaches in the world, yeah. but you've got to play as the coach. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, I, I, bought, I bought all the staff bought into it that in the end, recruitment was the most important and they understood it, that if they didn't have the players, they weren't in the job because they had nothing to coach. Yeah. So recruitment was, was the main force behind Everton's academy and the success of it. Um, it, it was just funny. I remember one of the coaches asking me for a left-back. I said, well, you know, I'm not just going to get you left back to make a team up. I've got to see vision in them. It's my name next to it. And, yeah. and then we got on talking about a forward then. And, and I'd offered this centre forward, the school and then everything to go with it, you know, and the package designed for Everton. And I remember the coach saying to me, you can't offer that. I said, yeah, I can. I said, if you look at my door, it's got head of recruitment. I recruit. Yours has got coach, you coach. As simple as that. And everyone just bears out laughing. And I've said I won the battle again on that one. Yeah. So that's the way it had to be. Um, the recruitment led it. And, and we were bringing the right types. We weren't bringing earlys in. We were bringing late developers. So yeah. I have to explain to the coaches, you ain't going to win every week with these because the late developers. Mm-hmm. But when you get to 15, 16, you'll start to see the fruits of it. And, and he did do. Mm-hmm. And he bought into that. And you just got to be patient. You can have the best team at under eight, and, and Everton did, by the way. Yeah. Everton had a lot of the best teams year after year. But we always had lots of late developers in there. Uh, and you can be an early developer and still make it. A lot yeah. of people thought Ross was early and done and all that, but Ross was big and good. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you can be that as well. So I don't buy into that either. Yeah. No, that's good. And in terms of 
qualities you look for in a player? What what qualities would you say? Well, maybe let's narrow it down to three most important qualities you'd look for in a player. Well, you, you go to a game, and the first thing that you've got to look for is the ability. You've got to have some sort of ability. A lot, a lot of staff in the coaching world thought that uh, a late developer was someone who was born in August. But you can be a late developer and be born in September. Yeah. You've got to know that. And that's only experience of recruitment and scouting. So the first and foremost is ability. And the way the way the game's played in this country, it has to be uh, athleticism. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, uh, and physique does come into it. You know, I still take a good little player if he's outstanding. Yeah. If, if the little player is a good player and he can't run, and he doesn't impact the game. He's never going to in, he's never going to impact it ever, is he? So you've got to have you've got to be looking always for ability, athleticism, and if you get the shape to go with it, great. If you don't get the shape, but he's outstanding and he's quick, then you you'll have a career in the game. Mm. So there's two key ones: is them, is the uh, ability and the the athleticism and shape. Uh, the other one for me is that desire. If you haven't got desire. You've got no chance. I've seen too many players who you've said that eight years of age, he's got no chance. Bad attitude, no desire, lazy. Mm-hmm. And they fall off. And you yeah. see it time and time again. And then you get a diamond who's not ready, but run through brick walls for you. He's there first for training. He listens, he does everything. And slowly, slowly, he gets better and better. So that they're the key ones. There is other bits they look for, but Probably them three would be the key ones. Yeah, and that, and that last point is really, some what you said really right at the start is the talented ones. If they don't put the work in, they'll just be overtaken by the ones who are not as talented, but just run the socks off, work hard, that work ethic. They'll overtake them eventually. Well, Jordan Henson is a prime example. So yeah. speak to people about Jordan. He wasn't the best player in, in, in Sutherland, mm. but he had that desire and passion to work and he got there in the end. Yeah. No. The way it is, football, you can't have it, you gotta love the job. And then, in terms of this series, we're talking about mindset and high performance. What to you, what does a high performance mindset mean? I think part of that again must be the desire in it, really. Because if you haven't got the desire, you'll never have that mindset. And I think everything leads back to that desire. So, if you've got the desire and the passion, then your mind is switched on in it and you're, you're focused. And, and, and and a lot of people say it's about me that I'm passionate about my job and I'm passionate about what I do, and that and that drives me on. And that mindset, my mindset was like, I want to stay in this job, so I've got to work harder than anyone else. Yeah. I've got to find an angle that I can be better, do something better than any other club. And hence, why I come up with flood everywhere, and you'll see more players, you'll get more players. Mm-hmm. All little things like that helped, and even when you were trying to sign a player. I mean, I can tell a funny story. I, the first team were brilliant with me and the, the managers were top notch. And I remember taking the player into Everton and uh, he was having his dinner with the first team. So it was at Belfield and sitting there, Gaz is in there. And, and Tommy Gravison comes in and he comes straight over to the player. I, uh, what position do you play? And he said, centre mid. He jumped over the table and started beating them up, going, you take my position. And he beat them up. But it was brilliant, and the boys signed for Everton after that. But things yeah. like that, they're all little edges, but he actually was genuine. I never told him to do any of that. He'd just done it. Yeah. And all the players bought into all that, because they'd been there before and understand it. Like Guilty Sigerson, we had him in at Everton when he was, uh, I think, 12, 11 or 12. And yeah. he, was, uh, he was a ball boy for that day. So I made sure he was a ball boy, and he, you know, he had the Everton experience. In terms of... Um... Obviously, loads of athletes, or maybe even loads in your career. Like, how how do you manage setbacks, um, and and how would you come back from them? Um, how do you manage them? I think you've got to have a good support team around you. I mean, you hear a lot about the mental problems in football. Well, I had twenty four years at Everton, and when I left them, I have to admit I struggled. Yeah. I couldn't cope because I didn't have that structure in my life. Mm-hmm. So I've been brought up on a structure of working hard. And, and you can imagine, since the lockdown, since last March, 
I haven't seen a live game. Yeah. I think I've been in the office twice. So again, it hits you, but you've got to learn to cope and put mechanisms in, in place that you, you try and keep your structure. Uh, so it, it, I think mental health, now understanding it a lot better. I do a lot with the boys that I have, and all the players I have at the agency now. So mm. uh, always plan for the future. Even though you might be only 15, 16 now, you've got to be planning now what you want to do at the end of your career. It might be property, it might be coaching, anything, business. Do something. I've even offered someone a work experience in companies just to get them ready because once you, once you come out of that environment that you've been in for years, it's, it's like well, your world's gone. So you have to have some structure. And, and can't be light just on football. Yeah. So that that's that's a key one for me with any any player. Yeah, and that's good. And then on the flip side, you've had so many accomplishments over your career. And um, what what stands out to you that you're most proud of, and why? Um, do you know? Do you know? It's a strange one. It's af- it's the afterlife of football. So it's it's seeing your old players again. Yeah. And, and then telling you. That was the best days of their life. Mm-hmm. Going, going on the tour, not like playing in the first team, but going on tours, having a laugh. I, so I was like the, the good guy and we had a, the coach who'd be the bad guy. I was the messer and he was the good one. And most of the time it was me doing all the messing <laughs> with the play. You know, we had a laugh and you've got to enjoy it. It yeah. can't be regimental. So I made sure that they had the best experience they could. I mean, that, that's... That's a big. I take pride in that. Uh, I remember Leighton Baines and uh, and Ryan Taylor being on Soccer AM, and I was in Portugal, and people were following me saying they're on Soccer AM, mm-hmm. and they get interviewed, and they get asked the highlights of the careers, which they play for England, they play in the Premier League, and the highlight was going on tour with Kiwis, our local team, <laughs> and we beat everyone and we won everything. Do you remember that the kids aren't they? And you remember more as a kid, don't you? And and, and that that's. I take great pride in that because I, I like to think I've looked after everyone who's walked through the door and looked after them properly. Yeah. And gone the extra yard. And most people will tell you. And I never said no. Yeah. Uh, I always said yeah. And I've done my best to get what they required. No, that's good. And that, that shows a real successful journey, I think, from you is that success of people still want to get in touch with you and tell you thank you and, and what they're Yeah, that's brilliant. brilliant. In terms of role models, Martin, have you had anyone who's influenced you and your journey on your life and why? Yeah, a couple of people. Uh, so Barry Poynton was one. Uh, he taught me how to look after staff uh, and helped me in my, my, my career. My pre evident stuff would go down to, uh, to, to three, three local people. Uh, Jimmy Oakley who passed away he was a, a coach at one of my a team that I had my lad at when he was four uh, Chris Cook Paul Cook's dad mm-hmm. he had a big influence on me uh, he was involved in that team and he guided me early on and I still keep in touch with him great fella and Joe O'Leary who run another local team and my lad trained with him when he was three he was like the Pied Piper you know he's famous in football long league football they had a big impact on me and how to look after players and that was a good start for me. Barry guarded me. Yui McCauley at Liverpool. Yeah. He'd always talk to me about players, what to look for. So I, I had a lot. And Roy Massey at Arsenal. So he was the right-hand man to Liam Brady, but he was the key person in the operation at Arsenal when they were successful. He's retired now. and He's right, written, he's wrote a book and he said he's given me a mention in it. Oh, so I was, was honoured to be that. When he retired at a, at Arsenal, I phoned him up to take him on. I wanted him, and uh, he said he'd just gone to Norwich. So, and then in the he finished Norwich a year later. I jumped on the train and signed him up for Everton. So he, was at, he had a few years at Everton, and his knowledge to my staff was unbelievable. Yeah, you know, he he let players like Harry Kane go, John Joe Shelby, but he explained why, and yeah. I can understand why he done it. And because uh, some players need that kick up the backside to go again. Yeah, no, definitely. Oh, you know. Yeah, it, so, is that so? Of, I'd say them, them type of people. Uh, 
have been good. And and to be fair, I always think you need a second man. And my second man was Alan McCormick. Mm-hmm. So he run the football team team with me. I brought him to Everton with me. And he'd be the one who, who dragged me back if I was going to make a, a rash decision, I'd say. Yeah. He, he always like, taught me down. And uh, he was a great fella. And we lost him about 10 years ago uh, through cancer. But uh, I suppose that out of all the football, that took me two years to get over him, losing him. It was like a void. And uh, I, I would say I never get over losing him, but he was a a big impact on my my career. No, good, brilliant. And well, then it's it, one. It's lots of people in your career that give you that leg up. Yeah, you you pick you pick the best of everyone, don't you, to hopefully make you the best version of yourself. So yeah, oh, and and one other thing I'd say to the, the students as well is uh, don't don't ever just be settled for what you've got. Mm-hmm. Always be forward thinking and try and have good bits to always tinker with it to make yeah. it better. What are Martin Waldron's three non-negotiable behaviours you'd expect from yourself and everybody else you come into contact with? Well, they're probably simple. Always be tidy and smart. Yeah. You go away on tour, you have your top stuffed in, your, your track suit zipped up. Uh, years ago, we used to go with travelling suits, shirt and tie and, and play, uh, club blazer. I think that goes a long way. So that, that's the first and foremost. Uh, for me, is that yeah. look on the path, behaviour, I won't it, and tolerate anything. We, we had a player at six years of age who threw a water bottle at a coach. And I was like, get him off, get him off. And then he's tipping the bench with the staff member on. I, I, I was like, you get the parents, I'll get the player. You know, and, and that's where you have to be like a school teacher is, that's not acceptable here. And I released him and he was a good player. But you can't have it because they'll they'll impact on other people's careers, yeah. and it's like a you put a bad apple in in a group, they all become bad, and, and you don't want that. So, so look on the part behavior. A uh, third one. I I mean, you know, it might be a mad one, but it's just just making sure that they are enjoying it. You know, the kids do enjoy all that. And make it fun for them. Mm. You should never walk into a training ground and think it's a chore or, or think you don't want to do it, but I'll do it because I've got to. Yeah. So it's just getting that across and that I'm getting the, the kids to buy into it. They've got to enjoy it. Well, it's pointless you being there. So probably there are the three things behavior, love on the part, and, and enjoyment. Yeah, no, I think, I think they're brilliant because I think that, that first one you said, looking the part, is those first impressions you give somebody are so important, aren't they? Um, yeah. This question: What advice would you give to a twelve-year-old Martin Waldron if he was to go back to school, knowing what he knows now? Right. Uh, regrets for me in school. I had the best time of my life in school, uh, but I messed a lot. Yeah. I was just a joker, and and reading and writing were my best subjects. Yeah. If I could change one thing, it would be that. And you need that. Uh, and I could have gone even a lot further, I suppose. I mean, I reached the top for me. I reached the top at Everton. That was like for me, we were the best academy in the country, and I was, I was in charge of the recruitment and other input input and everything. So work hard, get your basics right. You know, like do well at English, maths. Uh, for some reason, I was very good at maths and art. A matter stood me in good stead, I think. Yeah. Uh, negotiations and working things out. I think everything's some like a, a puzzle in life, isn't it? A match where it's everything counts. Yeah. So yeah, no. Yeah, I, I, one thing I always remember: my head teacher always said to me, and I kept in touch with him when I left school because he was involved in football. And he, he said to me, uh, "Even though you messed, you always had a heart of gold." So I always let you off. <laughs> and. I think that's, you know, that come across well. Like, care, you know, if you care, you go a long way as well. So, yeah. Well, if I was a young 12 year old now, it'd be way harder your, your cause of maths, English. Enjoy yourself. 
uh, it is some, for a lot of people the best time of their life being in school with your mates and that. Uh, and try and figure out what you want to do. I, I wanted to be a footballer, but I had no one to tell me, you're never going to be a footballer. Mm. So maybe talk to as many people as you can who are like senior staff. So like, if you can get in front of someone uh, who's a manager of a big company or you know, people like that, chief execs, you know, I've never knocked anyone back. If anyone's asked me for help and advice, I've always done it. I don't know why I've done it. I've just done it. I just think it was the right thing to do. Yeah, that's one for me. Ronaldo or Messi? And why? Wow, that's an hard one, that one. Yeah. Both different, aren't they? You've got that opposite end of the scale. You've got Messi, who's small, but very, very skillful. You've got Ronaldo, who's, who's got, he is skillful, but he's... He's a great physique and athlete, uh, an athlete, and imagine putting them together. You'd have the best ever, completely. Yeah. And if I'm being honest, I couldn't split them. Yeah. They're both just the best, best players for a long, long time, aren't they? Yeah. 